I suppose it's maybe best for us to just go through the whole thing, reviewing the so-called series that we have. Or, alternatively, I can answer your questions. Uh, just go through everything. Yeah, yeah. and then oh, there's too much questions. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then answer the question. Right. So, uh, you can start from the end, John. Well, that will be, uh, mm -hmm. it's technically possible, but I don't think it makes let's, let's start from the simple things and go to the end. We will try to time it so that we have enough time for, for the last unit. I'm sure that we need to discuss the last unit. Um, so let's see. We, we started with uh, direct currents and uh, circuits which do something with direct currents. And there, is, there isn't that much that you can do simply having currents and, I mean, voltage sources and, and resistors. Um, and we focused mainly on reducing the voltage and delivering voltage to another resistor. Thanks very much. Okay, so our first uh, theoretical ideas were the familiar notion of Ohm's law and what is resistance and what is voltage and what is current. And I, I still think that understanding the water analogy with, with those pipes filled with gravel resembling resistors and water pressure, it's very helpful because sometimes we, just finishing John Corley, people sometimes don't really have a good sense of what is that electricity like. You know, and this is a good analogy. So, Ohm's law, of course, and everything else. Let's talk about Ohm's law for a minute. Um, I equals V divided by R, of course. But that also implies something which we studied a little later, maybe in Unit 3, is that IV characteristic of uh, a resistor is a straight line. So you can represent Ohm's law as a formula, but you can also say that if you change either current or voltage and measure the other quantity, you will obtain a straight line on the IV curve or current voltage characteristic. And the steeper is the line, it's supposed to be straight, the steeper it is, the smaller is the voltage, because, I mean, the resistance, because obviously resistance is uh, delta V divided by delta I. So if this is delta V and this is delta I, small resistance corresponds to steep curves, large resistance to curves like this, infinite resistance flat, zero resistance vertical. If you studied superconductivity, which obviously we didn't here, you would see that when you're measuring a superconductor, the famous effect of zero resistance shows up with a straight line like this. Um, anyway, uh, so that's another way of describing Ohm's law. And this is also called ohmic behavior. <coughs> Only straight lines like this are ohmic, and they represent resistance. Uh, if anything else happens, for example, later we study the diode, which behaves like this, this is called non-ohmic behavior. It's obviously not a resistor. If you try to characterize it by the ratio this ratio is the same as V divided by I because the slope is the same everywhere. But here, V divided by I is this slope, which has essentially nothing to do with, with that element. Delta V divided by delta I, or dV dI, recalls 
dynamic resistance. Uh, and that would be, of course, a tangential slope at that point, and that has some meaning. But if you think about it, what it means is that, practically, what it means is that if, I, if I'm sitting at that voltage and I'm changing that voltage, current can be predicted according to the slope. In electronics and electricity, people call it small signal uh, situation. In other words, signal is small, not complete sweep across. Um, so, uh, okay, then when we talked about direct current, one of the cornerstone theoretical statements is that uh, potential energy can be defined in electricity and therefore electrical potential, which is potential energy divided by charge, is also well defined. And the signature of any potential energy, not necessarily electrical, any gravitational or anything, is that when you go around some kind of a loop and come back to the same point, uh, the total uh, change of uh, potential or potential energy will be zero. So that's a signature. Um, and that is called Kirchhoff rule number two. So people talk about loops and going around the loop, the sum of all voltage drops around the loop is zero. Very often we use uh, the same statement between two points, not necessarily going all the way around the loop, but going from point A to point B. And the statement is that uh, there are some elements here, maybe. Uh, batteries and so on. Uh, and if you say VA, minus current times resistance of various resistors. And whatever you meet here, you include, and you watch the sign, usually it's negative. If, if it's a current, then you're going downstream, right? From high potential to low potential, but therefore minus, going with the current. And then, if you included all the elements, let's say a couple of resistors to be specific, that equals VB. So the relationship between uh, two points can be described here, not going necessarily all the way around the loop. But this is the same as a full Kirchhoff going around the loop. And we use that too a few times. Okay, I probably should get practical and start talking about specific issues. So, voltage divider. Should I repeat that whole thing with seven and everything? Okay. Uh, therefore, one... So somebody sits down and thinks, what can I do with direct current? Not, not much, but one thing I can do is I can reduce voltage that I have to any specified value, and this is called the voltage divider, one of the simplest, if not the simplest, devices ever in electricity. And so, what we have is, is a battery, which we may call V in, and a couple of resistors, R1 and R2, and the current flows and we can measure voltage anywhere, maybe touching points with voltmeters, any kind of voltmeter that we have. But the most interesting, probably, in this simple circuit is to measure voltage here, we will call it VR. And we also said at that point that this is how people uh, drew circuits when studying <coughs> general physics, of course, like 132. But in electronics, people simplify, or maybe, I'm not even sure it's simplifying things, but they make it a little shorter. 
using electronic fashion, what we call, where they say, this is a terminal of that battery. This is one side of the battery. Now I show it with a little circle. And this is the end. And it's connected to the two resistors. And since in real life, you almost always we use ground, right? So here, you would be also ground. But normally in the physics book, people don't care to show it. But in real life, we have ground, and we measure voltages with respect to ground, which is common zero for everything. So the electronic circuit would be like this. In that circuit, as we said already many times, we're assuming second terminals. Here, there is another terminal going to the ground, and, and this whole thing is a battery, right? This is a battery. And here we assume that there is a second terminal going to the ground, and we measure voltage like this. So it's, it's also a loop. And we can apply Kirchhoff and everything. This doesn't look like a loop, but it is a loop. Okay. So um, we first warmed up to everything else by doing an extremely simple theory of a voltage divider using Ohm's law. And you don't even need Kirchhoff. Uh, it's, it's not a good practice to use Kirchhoff when you can get away with Ohm's law. So here you can definitely use on floor. And you can just say uh, current flowing here and not going anywhere else because this is a voltmeter, or maybe it's even open. Nobody even I didn't even show the voltmeter connected. So current definitely cannot go here either way. And the current is the in divided by the sum of the two resistors. Resistors famously add up in series like that. They are really in series with respect to that car. How do we know it's in series or not in series? The definition of being in series is that the same current flows through all of the elements. So that's, that means in series. Uh, uh, the train will pass through all the stations on a single route which has no branches. Right? That's, say, stations are connected in series. Uh, okay, um, that's the current by Ohm's law. V out is current times R2, and therefore V in R2, R1 plus R2. Uh, and uh, Essentially, that covers the whole not very complicated subject of making a theory here. But to make it more, more convenient, maybe for the future, we also said, well, our goal is to divide the voltage. By the way, we can only divide here. We cannot multiply or increase the voltage, only decrease in that simple circuit. Uh, if R1 is equal to zero, we will have the same voltage. It's a special case, which is not very interesting, but it's there too. Okay, um, so we said, let's call V in divided by V out some kind of coefficient. We want to divide by two, let's call it coefficient K equal two. So we defined here, V in divided by V out, coefficient K. You want to divide by 10, K is 10. Okay, uh, so you can, now that we know everything else that is to be known about electricity after the course is over, you know that this is essentially inverse of the transfer function. What people call transfer function is V out divided by V in. But here is just a dividing coefficient, which happened to be, if you want to be formal, or inverse of the transfer function. Okay, but transfer function doesn't make too much sense in this DC, simple DC circuit. Okay, so that will be uh, 
the in divided by the out will be pardon me uh, R1 okay R1 plus R2 divided by R2 or R1 over R2 plus 1 or in other words I learned a profound fact that to divide voltage the ratio of resistance has to be specific K minus 1 if I want to divide by uh, 2, K equal 2, resistors have to be equal. And you can see that this is, of course, true. So you know it's, the whole thing is true. Okay. Uh, that was simple voltage divider. If that was the end of it, we wouldn't have the force. Right? That would be very simple. But then we, we thought we need the job, we need to use more space and time and so on. So what can we do to complicate things? And we said, let's connect this to the load. Because after all, uh, this device by itself is totally useless. So it reduces the voltage. And what, what happens to the voltage? We measure it. So it seems like the purpose here is just to, to convince yourself that Ohm's law works. Basically, you don't learn anything else. Um, so in real life, this will deliver voltage to something we call a load. Whatever is connected to V out, we usually call a load. Okay. Maybe it becomes the out prime. We can see that the out prime is definitely smaller than old V out because these two resistors are in parallel. R2 and RL are definitely in parallel. And so there are you you remember the rule of thumb that when you connect two resistors in parallel, the result will be smaller than the smallest of the two. Okay, if, if they are equal resistors as a special case, it will be half of each, each of them. Uh, so this will be smaller than the old voltage. And of course, it's not a big deal to analyze the circuit without any additional theorems, just like this. But then, People say, but let's develop a general method for anything, not just this circuit, but for anything which has two terminals and inside there are batteries and resistors. Because there is an exact result which existed for many, many years from 19th century called, called seven and theorem. The seven and theorem is formulated like this. It says, if I have any circuit consisting only of voltage uh, sources and resistors, in principle also current sources, but we never see that, so we don't worry about it. But lots of batteries, or any number of batteries and resistors are inside. Don't forget that if we ask you to formulate that theorem, it's very annoying to forget, to, to see that people sometimes forget to say two terminals. Which means there are two outputs, A and B. Whatever is inside, we don't know and we don't care, but terminals are A and B. Um, and the theorem says that this whole complicated thing, whatever is inside, we don't even know what it is, uh, is equivalent to one battery and one resistor <coughs> and the EMF of that battery, ideal battery without internal resistance itself. Every resistance is uh, already absorbed in that value here. So it's an ideal battery with EMF. That EMF is called V7. And this resistor is called R7. And two terminals which we had before are still here, and it's A and B. So this whole thing is equivalent to one voltage source and one resistor. 
Now, it's tempting once you learn the electronics notation to use it here also, which leads to a lot of confusion. So I'm even sorry I ever showed how to use it because he don't want electronic notation. You really want the two terminals to be shown explicitly. Electronics not, not notation, electronics fashion of showing a circuit here is a little confusing. It would be uh, something like, like this. Uh, V7 here and R7 and there and another terminal this is V7 and, and another terminal this assumed brother not being shown here, assumed second terminal not being shown. And then you connect something here. So it is confusing. I really don't like this. Very often I see people connecting here the graph. And that's just so wrong that it, it's, 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 it's a proof that you don't want to use that electronic. You, you don't have a ground here. You, the ground is there, disconnected from here, and this is where you plug in the, the load between A and B. So don't do that. Let's not do that. Let's use this this circuit. Okay. Um, and the theorem is not finished because we introduced some new quantities here. We call V7 and R7, and it's our goal. To finish the theorem, we have to finish the theorem by defining what they are. And the definition is this. V7, and, and this is the only choice. In fact, here we don't, we, we don't have to have any fantasy or imagination to realize. It has to be simply the voltage between A and B measured with a good voltmeter, infinite resistance voltmeter. Voltage on the open terminal. So V7 is just VAB. And, however, R7 is defined like this. Measure, uh, okay, connect in, in terms of operations. In other words, here I'm connecting a voltmeter, ideal voltmeter measuring V7. To, me to find what R7 is, I connect here an ideal ammeter, and I measure the current I call I short circuit. <coughs> because I'm short circuiting, I, ideal ammeter has zero resistance, it's like connecting a wire here, but I don't, I, I need to know the current. So, and R7, and that's what I don't like about. Is V7 and divided by that I short circuit. And I always um, thought that if I, for some reason, have forgotten what, what, what this should be, I can all, all, always say the whole theorem should be still true if I only have one battery here and one resistance. Maybe the battery with its own internal resistance is inside. It's a special case. Instead of million batteries and 10 million resistors, I have one and one. But then this formula is, is a natural result of Ohm's law, and it works. So it must work in this special case. Okay, so that's that's a seven and series. Then, in general, then there are a couple of shortcuts which apply to special situations. This is general, but maybe you know the circuit. Maybe you know that the circuit is simple enough to calculate things. Then you can find both voltage and resistance violation. Case in point, our voltage divider, right? Let's have our simple voltage divider. And since we decided to, for now, for this particular subject, to stay away from electronics notation, electronic circuits, let's have the old fashioned. Circuit, which will already consider R1 and R2. And A and B are here. Um, 
and this is V in, and this is V out. Then, uh, let's, let's do this first by applying the theorem in its pure general form and then see what the shortcut may be here, because there is a little shortcut for calculating resistance. Um, okay, the, the general form of the theorem we just discussed says Given the voltage between A and B when they are open, and we know what that is, we already said that, that V out or VAB is V in divided by R1 plus R2 times R2. Or you could, in fact, now that we have our little coefficient K, we could just say V in divided by K. This is also true, the same thing. Okay, that's the voltage. Now, what about short circuit current? Here, I think we already know that we have to be careful. We have to short that out with an ammeter. That takes R2 out of commission. It does not do anything anymore. It's short. The potential difference between these two points must be zero all the time now, because this is zero resistance. So the current I short circuit current, which flows like this, is, and we could have a ground here, of course. Short circuit current is going to be simply the in divided by R1 and combining uh, this and that, we could, well, using this form or that form doesn't matter very much. We will have R7 and is V7 and divided by I short circuit and therefore V in R2, R1 plus R2 divided by V in R1. And V in cancels out, and we get this very familiar to us now result. R1 and R2 divided by R1 plus R2. And this is what we get. We don't argue about this. It's precise and so on. But if we really want to say something about it, we, we may be puzzled. We may be saying, this is a parallel resistor formula. It's really the same as 1 over R effectively equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, isn't it? This is, this is what it is. Why? These two resistors, we, we always knew that they're in series. Current flows through them one after the other the same current. They must be there in series. So how come somehow seven on equivalent resistance is parallel? And clever electronics people and books sometimes explain that oh, this is because if you change voltage here from the second stage of that, you connected that to something and you raise the voltage a little bit. The current will flow backwards splitting it between these two resistors. So in a sense, this is like looking at, at these two resistors from this side. The observer, to use the physics word, right? Probably inappropriately. But the observer is looking from the output inwards and sees these two resistors like if they were in parallel. It's not the proof. It's only... A, a little argument to show that maybe it makes sense. The proof is here. We, we didn't do anything. We didn't think. We just used the theory, right? Okay. So, we get this result. We understand that this formula is only for this circuit. It's not a general result of any kind. It's only for this specific circuit. Um, now, 
the purpose of Theven and Ethereum, again, is not to finish here, but to apply it to a load, so to use this now with the load. So let's do that to see why we suffered through all of this. So this circuit with its terminals A and B may be connected to a load. RL here. Seven and Ethereum says that this whole thing is equivalent to one battery and one resistor, and I know how to find. So this whole circuit will look like V7 and then let me put it right here. I can move resistor anywhere along one loop, right? So I will put R7 in here. And I will make RL between A and B. And maybe this is wrong. That circuit I can already very nicely uh, represent also using electronics. Four. But since I started, let me keep making this complete loops, not to confuse different notations in different ways. So, um, looking at this and asking, what will be that the out prime in that circuit? I can see that. The output voltage will be anything I want with the ratio here. But if I want it to be the ideal voltage that was produced here in the voltage divider, then the conclusion, and this is the punchline of the whole discussion, is that this will be true if R7 is voltage to RL. Then this essentially equals to Z. Right? That has to be understood. This is maybe where we sometimes lose track of <coughs> logic. So logic is, if I want V7 and my ideal voltage, V7 and is my ideal voltage, delivered some place to the load, I better make R7 much smaller than the load. So the condition is R7 and much smaller than RL, then V out, maybe I call it V out prime, whatever, is approximately equal to V7 and which is ideal. Ideal in the sense that maybe I made a circuit to produce something between A and B, and I want to deliver that off to my load. That's the idea that the, the original voltage was idea. Yes. I just want to clarify, you have V out prime. There are two um, terminals where you put this dot on the one, correct? Right, okay. right. So, so, you right, you're right. This is V out prime between these two terminals. Also equal to V A V prime, maybe. Prime meaning that now we have a load before we have pure A and B as output. Okay, so you want, now you, you start bargaining with yourself, I guess. What do I want? 1% precision, then this has to be roughly 100 times smaller than that. 10%, 10 times smaller, and so on. Um, now, specifically, we always oscillate between general seven and theorem and specific very nice example of voltage divider with the load. So the voltage divider, we know that R7 is R1, R2, R1 plus R2. So that has to be much smaller than RL. For the voltage divider only. And we can see why Y7 and is useful. We instead of considering three resistors, R1, R2, and RL, we're considering only two. This one and RL. And we're comparing them. 
and it's a unified way of seeing the, the stroke. Right? So I, I was talking about a shortcut, coming back for a minute. The shortcut is that you, you realize that if we short out, if we, let's, let's draw this. <coughs> if I will remove the battery and replace it with a piece of wire, and all the batteries, by extension, all the batteries in that black box, I replace with shorts, only leaving resistors and nothing else. At least in this specific case, it works out. If I short this out, these two things are in parallel, and I get the parallel resistor formula just by measuring resistance between A and B. So the statement is, if you want to calculate not measure, but calculate R7. You can do that by shorting out all the batteries and just calculating resistance between A and B, and it works. And the claim is for any circuit, not just for the oldest one. Okay, it's a shortcut of some kind. If you know the circuit and if it's simple enough to calculate. If it's 10 million resistors, I don't want to even start. But if it's a couple of resistors, maybe I can manage to calculate. Okay, um, so uh, then maybe I should, since this is the end of the course and we know what, what followed, a couple of times we saw applications of this idea, not only for voltage devices or in some more complicated circuits. For example, at one point, we were considering a transformer delivering some voltage to, I believe, a clipping circuit. And we decided maybe the voltage here is still too high. And what, what can we do? We can, in principle, reduce that voltage by using uh, a potentiometer. And then it was going to some resistor, and I believe it was a clipping circuit like that. Uh, and we found that when you measure AC, the circuit in AC, it was, I believe, in at least in one of the first examples. Uh, when you measure this circuit in AC, you find a strong asymmetry. In other words, something like this happens. Big, big negative parts and much smaller uh, positive parts of a signal will be observed here. Why? And then we realize, well, the reason must be that when this diet Oh, and it was a rectifier, wasn't it? Not, not a clipping circuit. Apologies, it was like this. Rectifier circuit, okay. It was, in fact, halfway rectifier discussion. Yeah. We realized when diet opens up, it's, it's zero. It's essentially like you're producing a short in the first approximation. When this is suddenly shorted, on not suddenly, in half of the period, <laughs> more or less. Whatever resistance is, is here, sees this load becomes visible to, to the circuit. When the diode is closed, it has very large resistance and the load is hidden or not visible. So that must be the reason for asymmetry. Uh, <coughs> we looked at, at this potentiometry, which I believe was MK, and we knew, because we were told the, the voltage, we knew the ratio, of what, what were, potentiometry like this is equivalent to two resistors, R1 and R2, which R1 plus R2 is 10K, right? And as you 
change the position of the potentiometer. R1 and R2 are changing, but the sum is fixed. So it's another way to look at potentiometer, right? And we could figure out what these things were. If we figure that out, when the diode is open, suddenly we have the, the, old, the same problem we just discussed. Simple voltage divider looking at the load. We know what to do. We know that 7 and equivalent will be R1, R2 divided by R1 plus R2. Compare this with this load, which I believe was 2K, and you find that your voltage will be significantly reduced because the load is not very large, significantly reduced. And that explains the whole thing. In the negative half of the cycle, this is close, and you don't see the load. It's perfect. It delivers whatever voltage is here by R1, R2, right? So um, something like this is helpful. It explains everything numerically, specifically, not just hand waving, right? So this is an, uh, one application of seven and here in Vesua later on in the course. Another was this a symmetrical divider we used in unit five. I'm I'm not going to go there, but but it could be used. Too. Okay, so we discussed seven. Let's we have so much more that maybe we should move on, right? Unless you have questions. <clears throat> Let's see, after we finished with unit one and DC current, we said a lot more can be done with AC voltage. And this usage of the word, by the way, is somewhat imperfect because AC stands for alternating current. So when I AC current, it's alternating currents, currents, <laughs> or AC voltage, alternating current voltage. None of this is really good, but that's an accepted good. That's what we call it. Anyway, um, T. Sinusoidal and other signals, we discussed them. Averages only RMS makes sense, and direct average is zero. Capacitors were very interesting. They proved to be really a big source of interesting results because famously, as we already said so many times, capacitor is equivalent to, to this. And this comes directly from the definition of capacitor. And so we use this circuit to have filters and to have integrators and differential. Now, wouldn't, wouldn't it be boring if I started again giving you the whole phaser theory? Uh, or do you want to hear it? No. Please, no. <laughs> the same. Please don't ask me to, because, yeah, let's assume we understand. Sorry, it's a deal. We don't ask you, we don't ask us. <laughs> <laughs> That I cannot promise. <laughs> um, let, let me, okay, to, to fulfill my legal obligation, let me say this. In a phasor theory, if you do it geometrically, as I prefer, because it's picturesque and it gives me a very good understanding, the main thing is really the diagram. Everything else is very simple. Uh, Pythagorean theorem on algebra, which anybody can do. But understanding what this diagram means, that's the whole story. So let's just talk about the diagram without going any further. One more time, very quick. So we have two circuits. Now we're back to electronic fashion of drawing the circuit. One where capacitor is on top resistor at the bottom, and the other one the exchange, right? Let's consider one of them. <coughs> this is V in, V out is V R. It's very important, it is simple, but, but very, very important not to 
uh, get what's what, what, what is out, what is in, and what is the total voltage, and what is a specific voltage, so, so, so um, this circle, which I keep drawing, means simply a trace of the end of some kind of rotating vector. And we usually start with current. I say current is now a vector. And it rotates around one of its ends with omega, which is uh, 2 pi f, where f is real frequency of a signal. And why current is the first one to be considered? Because it's the same everywhere. Current is the same in this two elements. It doesn't matter that it oscillates that it is AC. It is still the same at every moment in time, the same value of current everywhere. Okay. So current is a good reference because of that. Then, voltage across the resistor will be in the same direction as the current. Why? Because Ohm's law has no intricate parts to it. It's just relationship between current and voltage through a scalar resistor. And so it cannot introduce any phase shift. So Vr is I times R. And when we, draw, when we write capital letters like I and V, these are amplitudes. And when we write small letters like, like this curved little v and little i, these are time dependent ones. So if this is the rotating uh, pigment of my imagination, I understand that the real world is a projection of this, and I decided to take projections onto the horizontal axis. So this is. This is the current at some moment t. At this moment t, this is the current. Uh, uh, well, it, yeah, if I worry about current. Why is that connected to the top of the orbit, not the top of the orbit? Because I, I said this is the current, not the voltage. Uh, the, this would be, OK, this is little vr as a function of t. This i, if I want to go to much hated trigonometry, that was the whole idea to get away from it, but if I have to go back to trigonometry, I would say little i of t equals i amplitude, this whole thing, times cosine omega t, where omega is the angular velocity or angular frequency of this thing, which is 2 pi f. f is a real frequency. You never see omega on the oscilloscope. You see real f, right? OK, so that would be the real current. But we don't care too much about currents, except that they give us reference. We worry about voltage. So voltage across the resistor is oscillating according to this rotation of, of the shorter and my I mean this have different units so I could make them longer or shorter I show voltage there. So the reason I show it here is simply because I'm used to it. There is no re real reason. So this rotates producing oscillations in voltage across the resistor. At the moment in time this projection is a real voltage across the resistor. When you use a oscilloscope, you see that curve, and you can say what that was at any moment in time, right? OK. And it's in phase with current, because Ohm's law cannot <coughs> change in phase. Now we introduce the capacitor, and we're saying we can show, I'm not going to do that through this formula, being careful about everything. We show that capacitor is here, 90 degrees behind the current and behind the voltage across the resistor, lagging what they call current. Voltage across the capacitor lags current. This is the vector. It rotates on its own circle, and its projection is the real voltage across the capacitor. 
And that is out of phase by 90 degrees. This is the first, right? Okay. Then it's very important to have this very large and clean diagram because there is a lot you need to show on it. One thing to show is where is V out and where is V in. So now we're saying, but of course, V out is V R. So this is also, let's not worry about little V because that's only when somebody asks, where is reality here? You say it's projection onto this axis, but nobody ever asks. So um, we can say V R is V out. That is just obvious from our diagram here, from the circuit, right? Where is V in? Well, V in is across both V R and V C. Therefore, we say we take this seriously. We believe that this works if we represent them as vectors. Therefore, it's a vector sum. And here you have to have a better diagram to show this, but it will be something like this. The vector sum of VR and VC will be V in. And this is again an amplitude. When I draw straight, large capital I mean, letters, this amplitude. Again, this is an amplitude and it has its own projection, which I'm not worried for now, but it also oscillates at some phase and so on. This is the projection. Okay? All right. Uh, so V in and V out are identified. And now we can derive formulas. And we can also derive the phase shift. So we derive first, we derive the formula for the transfer function V out amplitude divided by the mean amplitude as a function of omega. And that's just, as I said, this is the easiest part. Once the picture is good, that's that's only a couple of minutes, Pythagorean theorem, and you're done. Okay? And we can derive phase shift, which is call it beta as a function of omega. And that is between what? And and here there is a difference. I think I said this before. Let me repeat it. In Giancoli, Mr. Giancoli worries about the phase shift between current and voltage. Current and this resultant voltage. So he would always take this as a, as, as, as a phase shift. We worry about what we can measure, and that is phase shift between V in and V out. In our case, it happened to be the same as John Cook in my specific circuit, yes. However, if I consider the other circuit with C and R interchanged, V R would not be V out, V C would be V out. So I would be interested in, maybe I call it beta prime, in the other circuit, while Jan Coley is still interested in this, because it's between current and V in. So here lies a little subtle difference. Okay. So we can figure out our phase shift as a function of frequency, and we're done. The theory is exact, there are no approximations. No. You define V out over V in with respect to omega. What value would this be the ratio of two of these? We're looking only for the ratio. Yes. Okay. That, that's what we call a transfer function okay. as a function of frequency. Right. Um, okay, so I think the rest is clear, so we, we can proceed. Yes. Um, you can able to show how far the impedance for the capacitor? Oh, okay. All right. Impedance for uh, the cup, uh, impedance, or I think people normally call it reactions. Impedances for everything, specific things are called reactions. But it doesn't. 
Uh, for the capacitor, well, we say the only thing we know about the capacitor is this. This is what capacitor is doing. And so, since we're interested in capacitor voltage across the capacitor, we have to invert that, and therefore, we say that V C equals 1 over C integral I C D T. And in our picture, I C is simply current. Let me put that current out. And here I have cosine omega t dt. So again, why, do, why don't I have any kind of phase shift? Why phase shift for the current is zero? Because current is my reference. That's what gives it the right to have zero phase shift. In other words, this is always omega t from the horizontal line to the current without any phase. I started time count when current was horizontal and I started counting time. So it's like this. Then we have to take an integral of a cosine function. And we argue that it must be 1 over omega, which I can take out of the integral sine omega t. And I check the derivative and I see that it works, right? However, our reality, again, is the horizontal axis. We don't like sines anymore. We cannot mix cosines and sines. Once you start at saying all signals, currents and voltages, are projections onto one of the axes, and we chose horizontal, we have to stick to it. So we don't like to have sine. Therefore, we say, well, how can I transform sine into cosine? Here is the sine of omega t. This is omega t, and this is its sine. Well, looks like if I subtract pi over 2, I will have positive cosine, which is obviously equal to that sine. And some people remember this from school, but I don't. You know, I just have to figure it out. So, um, minus pi over 2 going here. So, the end result is I divided by omega c cosine omega t minus pi over 2. So, we derive two things at once. We derive phase shift, that the fact that Vc lacks the current, goes behind the current in this rotation. Rotation is always counterpoint. Right? Um, and we derive also that the coefficient for the, this is amplitude, right? So we also found that Vc amplitude equals I divided by omega C, or I times something which we call reactants, and reactants is 1 over omega C. Okay. This is one result that this reactant is like that, which is very useful in understanding filters. In, in the very simplified way, without worrying about phase shift, but understanding what they do, right? When we talk about RC filters, we say low frequency reactance is large for the capacitor. So most of the voltage at low frequency will fall across the capacitor. Therefore, less voltage is left for the resistor, blah, 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 it's a filter, right? And both filters are described like that. So it's a very simple way of seeing what filters do. Okay, so we did that. We more or less covered phase or something. Let's call it phase or day. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what, what is then? Um, after that, we said, but this thing's also integrate and differentiate. Why? Because the formula is there. Because it has derivative in it, and inverting it has an integral. So 
they differentiate an antique ray. So you want me to discuss that for RC and then later for no, probably not. Just do the later stuff, like the computer. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> like start like the symmetric voltage divider things are confusing, yeah. not the stuff that we want. Um, fortunately, I just have a question for you with respect to integrators and differentiators. Sure. For the exam, are we permitted to refer to them as high pass and low pass filters if they are well, integrators and differentiators, or do you want us to refer to them as? I let, let me. I'll explain my position with respect to how we call this. Yeah. It's not a major issue. It's, it's only words which are not significant, essential. So, I, I think it's a different application, and the same circuit can be used in two different uh, applications. One to make a filter, another one to make a differentiator or integrator. And to, to call it that this filter is a differentiator or this filter is an integrator it would be a little confusing. So I would just be careful about how I express it. <coughs> I fully realize that yes, it has a, this other application. Uh, so I would be just careful. To differentiate and integrate, as you know, with RC circuits, you have to restrict frequencies. You cannot do it in any frequency, only in a certain frequency range. That's how you distinguish one from the other. Yeah, so would it be fine to just say that like in this circuit this acts as a yeah, aspect that's right, something like that. I, I'm not going to be very just to specify that it depends on on how it's used inside the circuit. Right. In other words, if I if you just tell me uh, all uh, low-pass filters are integrators. I am a little unhappy because it's unfinished business. You should tell me at high frequency, and then I will be happy. Uh, so uh, the applications are really different, and, and one works at any frequency, because filter, by definition, is the same which works in the whole frequency range, doing what it does, filter, right? Integrator only works here. So if we're careful about that, I don't care too much. Um, okay. It's just uh, we don't want additional confusion. That's all. Um, so uh, should we? Jump to RPMs and then maybe if we go back to yeah. Yeah. more confusing than yes. Yes. Especially those and like the shorter ones. Ones. It's a shorter lap and most be quicker to read than okay. In my opinion, unit five is the least confusing of them all. But let, let's go. Okay, I need to go. Can we definitely go over this metric voltage divider thing, too? Um, yes. Okay, let me go through the symmetric voltage divider in, in a simplified fashion. Um, can I ask a question about yes. this, actually? On the lab, like the one you present as the example, is completely symmetric. Like the two resistors are exactly the same, and obviously the plus 15 and the minus 15. But when we actually did it, the voltages we were getting were equal, the resistors were equal. Would you ask like an unequal one on the test or only where it's like perfectly well, symmetric? I was, just, I was just going to put you at ease by saying that while it's very easy to generally understand what this divider is doing, simply limiting the voltage, not to the full range, but smaller range, right? I will not in the exam ask you about the torturous calculations. Uh, I will not. I will, if, if you see it, it will be its main function, maybe. But not any kind of permanent uh, calculations and so on. They are not going to be in the exam. So, now, now we're not afraid of this divider. Divider is just... 
we understand what it does, right? That's not a problem, right? It limits, we don't want plus 15 and minus 15 to be applied to something, maybe, or up there. So people say, well, why not have side bands, which will limit the voltage to smaller range. If, if this is 10K and this is 2 and 2, roughly you're going to get uh, out of this whole thing, you will get plus minus what, 11 or 12 volts, and that's good. You don't want to go to the limits. So these are just protecting your device from too high low or too high absolute value. So, right? I think that we understand. If, if, if you don't have to calculate, I got carried away with that little calculation. I thought it's a good example. It is a good example, but I'm not going to ask you some things. So we just have to know that it limits the voltage, right. that's it. We don't have to know like Right, okay. right. So that settles that issue. Also, I don't want to make an impression that this is a central point when it's a very much secondary point for, for the whole unit. You don't even have to test your up amp in this way. You can always use AC, which is so convenient to test. Uh, testing it with AC, you can get the square wave and you know what it does without slowly changing voltage. Anyway, so it's not important. Okay, uh, now let's go. Uh, my proposal is let's formulate so called golden rule. That's how people call them. I didn't invent them. So golden rules for the up amp. And go through all the circuits that we ever saw with golden rules and what they will do. In fact, I discovered something I'll show you, which I kind of like concerning integration with up amp. You can apply golden rule without going through that uh, design in your head procedure. You can actually just see what, what will happen. But let's go through everything. So the, the main principle of negative feedback, let's repeat what it is. If you take an output and connect it back to the input in a negative sense, subtracting some part of the input, this is already called negative feedback in every application in mechanics, in everyday life, or in electronics. So we take output, and part of it is fed back into the input, subtracting, not adding, but subtracting the part. That's negative feedback. Turns out to be a magic thing, very useful. Okay. To do that most effectively, people decided to use very strong amplifiers which they call up amps. And this amplifier will reinforce that negative feedback to the maximum because it's just a strong amplifier. It's a strong mechanism. Um, so this amplifier has essentially five important terminals which two of them we usually don't show in circuits. These are simply power supplies, but they have to be connected in real life. But in the exam, you don't depend on them. Then there are three important terminals which are called inverting, non-inverting, and output. And by itself, it's a strong amplifier with amplification factor of maybe one million. Hundred side. Um, it will amplify. It's essential to understand also that it amplifies the difference between the inputs. So when it amplifies, it amplifies V plus minus V minus times some large number A of the order of a million. Maybe. And that will be the output. 
Now, because this number is so large, it takes very little difference before you reach output, which is plus minus 14 volts, and turns out that this is the limit of what they can do. So their amplification is over extremely short range in terms of V plus minus V minus simply because it's so large, and it is something like this. But then you saturate, so V out will very quickly saturate, so I think plus 14 or minus 14. Cool. So this is the transfer characteristic of V out with respect to V in <coughs> of, of the amplifier itself. Okay, now <coughs> we're using them. There is so... Yes. I'm just a bit confused. You have, it's V out versus just the difference? Just the difference. Okay. They are differential amplifiers. So okay. later on, when we build in the optional last assignment, but I will talk about this because I want to include the theory here. It's so nice, I don't want to miss it. So in that optional last assignment eight, right? We talked about differential amplifier built on the basis of set. So it's an interesting thought that we're building controllable differential amplifier on the basis of just uncontrollable, very large gain differential amplifier, one on top of the other. All the other circuits are something else, but that one is specific and differential amplifier built on the basis of this useless differential amplifier. Useless because it's not controlled yet. So that just provided control. Okay. Um, now, the easiest, well, maybe we can also do this thing. Before we formulate golden rules, let's actually connect negative feedback. And remember, we decided inverting and non-inverting input can be shown in any order, one on top of the other or another around. It doesn't matter. We just have to keep track of where they are. Let's connect a fraction beta, which is greater than zero and less than one of the output to the inverting input. And um, this is V in. So I guess what I'm going to try to do is to, to write some formulas without using golden rules. I haven't formulated golden rules yet. I just was to use the fact that this is a strong amplifier. I know it amplifies whatever it sees between these two inputs very strongly. I want to see what happens. That's all. So, uh, V out is A times V non-inverting minus V inverting. This is the basic statement about up end, right? We just used the set of before. So it's A, V plus is V in, minus, and here we said, let's take fraction beta of the output to here. So it's minus beta V up, isn't it? I'm not making any approximations. You see, golden rules are approximations. This is so I see a little algebraic equation where the quantities on both sides, that's presumably a signature of that negative feedback. And I, I want to combine the terms. So I will have V out plus beta A V out equals A V in, right? 
then b out, therefore 1 plus beta a equals a v in. And finally, uh, maybe I can write v out equals a divided by 1 plus beta a v in. So I didn't make any approximations. You see, I'm just saying let's write down what that negative feedback will be doing. And a is a very large number. What if I divide by a here and here? A is maybe one million. So I will have one, one divided by a plus beta. And that starts to tell me something very interesting. It says, because one over a is so small, it will be totally negligible and it disappears. With very great precision, this is equal to one over beta v in. So what did I get? I get, again, very often we reduce everything to transfer function. So transfer function v out over v in is going to be 1 over beta. So if I decided to make beta 1 tenth, for example, this beta may be 1 tenth of, of the output then this will be equal to 10. So I see that I got myself already an amplifier, if I do that. <laughs> but this amplifier, this device, is totally controlled by, by this thing. Whatever is here, if beta is fixed by some kind of outside circuit, that controls what it does, not A. A is that wild card sitting inside, right? I don't want to depend on A because one of them will have one million, another one nine hundred thousand. I don't want to depend on that number. It's just enough to know that it's very large. And so the whole thing is controlled by the negative feedback circuit. Whatever you put here controls the whole thing. That's the whole idea. Okay? So that was not even golden rules yet. But golden rules are sort of falling from, yes. Um, so we're, we're sending in some small, relatively smaller data, we're getting out a larger VI, right? Not uh, necessarily, no, <laughs> not with this. It could be a follower. If, if I made the Yeah, no, 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 right, it could be a follower, right? But that's sort of the lower limit. And we're sort of getting that extra voltage from those two extra... Uh, well, connections. whatever extra power we're getting is obviously from... Probably. And we can't, in other words, this, you, you can't, it can't give you more voltage than it's, than it's getting it, right? But I, where is that limitation in this equation? In other words, this doesn't tell me anything that it can amplify so long as it's not adding more than 14 volts. This is the exact result. There is no limitation here. However, if I uh, give it V in, which is too large, so that V out would have to be greater than 14 volts, it just stops working. It says, sorry, you can't give me so much at the input. I will not handle that. So that is a limitation. No, I understand that limitation, but where is that in the equation? It's not in that equation. Uh, it, it will be precise until you hit that limitation. If V in is one volt and this is 10, let's say this is point 0.1. Let's have this, I, I said this already, let's have beta equal point 0.1. One over beta is 10. If V in is one volt, V out will be 10 volts. No limitation. And all the way to 10 volts from all values here, everything will be working perfect. In fact, even to 14 volts. So when this, in my specific example, when this is 1.4 volts, this will be exactly 14 volts. And that will hit the ceiling. And then it doesn't work anymore. If I keep increasing this, then the, the device tells me, well, you can increase it all you want. I cannot do anymore. But 
it's not in the control, the equation is precise, it just hits the maximum value. So, it's in the limit so you can say v, if you want to write mathematically, and v out less than 14 volts, plus minus. So it's in the assumption that it's still a linear amplifier. Yeah. Okay. This is in, in the linear region, but we know it has this horrible exactly. saturated flux. So you can, this will become mathematically a leak part. You cannot argue. This is the final statement. Um, something I'm confused about is, uh, so before you have the negative feedback and you input V in, you have some V out that you use to put back in. And once you have a different V out from that V difference, Plus and minus inputs. Say it again. Uh, uh, so before you apply the negative feedback, you just input V in. And right. you, get, you get some V out. Yeah, right. And then that's with the zero input and the minus input, zero volts and minus input. And then you you input beta V out into that, and you have a new difference of V out of V in minus beta V out. So why is it the same V out? Uh, I think you're talking about naked or not without negative feedback, or did, maybe you said let's let ground this uh, inverting, uh, non-inverting input is grounded, and, and this this uh, starts from zero, right? So this will increase according to this very steep slope, million times larger, and very quickly saturated. That's all you will get, right? If you go on the negative side, it will continue on the negative side and saturate there. So you will get your transfer function. With negative feedback, the control is transformed from this giant amplification, which is useless to keep to something outside. The whole control is here. The control, the, the remote control is now here. And it tells you what, what it will do. It may do many different things. You know that it's not only amplifiers, it's all kinds of things. We will now move to integrators and to other stuff. So I don't know what what else to say. I think you've seen it sort of as a dynamic thing that the out comes out and wants to be one thing. And then it gets Oh, sort of the dynamic keeps going back and forth. Okay, I see what yeah. 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 The dynamic argument is as misleading here as it was when we discussed limiters. This thing is not switching back and forth. It is finding a load line which will make it stable and at some it's, point. It's and that's the same Yeah, yeah the it's, it's just this V out, uh, in other words, <laughs> talking about this. Transfer function, some kind of a point will be stabilized by the outside circuit. This point is not exactly zero, but it's close to zero. So as the circuit starts, eventually the same VI. Right. Will it will establish. Okay. And to establish that, people say you have to have a way for electrons to pass through, through this branch. They will establish the right voltage position. They will not continue to flow because this resistance here is empty. We will talk about this now with golden rule. But but they have to flow initially to establish some voltage levels to charge certain capacitors inside. What was not? But okay. So now I'm coming to golden rule. So this is a perfect place to say that. When I say V plus equals V minus in a golden rule with negative feedback, that means that the voltage is within that range. It's not really zero, the difference, but it is very small and negligible, a few microvolts, which we don't care about. So golden rules are approximate description which allows you to analyze circuits. All set. Okay? All right? Are we comfortable here? All right, now let's let's formulate golden rules and go through all the circuits. I think it's important. And it's kind of, after a while, it becomes very simple to analyze the circuits. Almost 
simple to the point that you start becoming suspicious. Am I doing the right thing? It's, it's too simple. But that's the truth here. It is too simple. Uh, so, uh, the first circuit we will consider, uh, the first golden rules. Okay, golden rules. There are only two of them. They're very simple. Yes? One says, this negative feedback, V plus equals V minus. And I just said that this is approximate, but they are within a few microvolts from each other, and I don't care to know the details. It will be actually some kind of a point determined by some kind of load line, which I don't worry about, because it's too small to work, right, in terms of volts. Okay, the second rule says resistance into the half amp is very large, practically infinite, currents never flow into I plus and I minus, I only hear. Is that even without negative? It's even true without negative. Because the construction is still the same. Okay, so these are golden rules. So the first one we gave an argument as to why it holds, right? Yeah. Uh, the second one. The is second one is a, this is how they built it. it. It's just this is how it's done, and we don't look inside. We just know that we cannot pass currents. You, you can't pass currents into the board. Why? Because it's there, because it's dialectical. Okay. Um, with these rules, I claim we can explain all the circuits now with negative feedback relatively simply and without too much difference. Let's start with the easiest, which is the follower. So the first circuit is the follower, which will be like this. We simply connect V out and inverting input with the Y. Zero resistance Y, right? And I claim this is the follower. In other words, knowing what followers were in a transistor world, I'm claiming, and I will show hopefully in a minute, that whatever V in is doing, V out will be repeating. And when people say, but why do you want a complicated device to repeat something like that? Because you could just connect points A and point B with wire, and you will have the same. The answer is yes, but here input resistance is infinite. And therefore, I can attach here any kind of load I want, and nothing bad will happen. It will deliver that same signal to load without any regard to what the value of this load is. Yes, there is a limitation here with the current, but that has to do with just this device being made of, you know, not of fantasy, but of real materials. It can take so much current. But apart from that, it will repeat the signal. In what sense the power one. The range of between one, the, the range of voltage between five and the four. Mm. No, here it depends on, on, on the value of the slope. Right. If this if this is one kilo, you never see a limitation at all. But if we're talking about slope. But, but, but if it's 100 ohms, you can deliver up to maybe 4 or 5 volts. In transistors, uh, we also uh, perhaps have some power limitation with small load. I don't know, maybe, maybe, in this sense, maybe transistor has little advantage. I never thought about it. Yes, okay. But, but here, uh, the advantage here is that the input is infinite. You don't have to, you don't have beta times RL 
made to be 100. You don't have that. You have 10 to the 12 volts, no matter what you do there. It's, it's perfect. And the, the tail repeats what the, the mouse is doing. Right? Okay, how do I know that golden rules shows us women therapy? We already saw the exact result where beta was equal to 1. We already know the answer there. But using golden rules, it's a one-liner. We say V in is the same as V non-inverting. By golden rule number one, this is V inverting, which is V out. So V in equals V out. End of story. And the fact that current does not flow is still useful because that's infinite <coughs> resistance. That means that I don't depend on the load. I can reproduce any kind of signal, except for the limitation of current. Can you have a negative feedback back on the thing beyond the non-inverting input? No. If you connected the out to the non-inverting input, it would be called positive feedback. And instead of having this, what will happen is the slightest disturbance here will jump the output to plus and minus 14 volts, even faster than before. Okay, it was fast enough in our experience without negative feedback. With positive feedback, it reinforces that it, it goes to the extreme very quick. In fact, people use it when they need fast feedback. So if I get a voltmeter to measure voltage across my RL, will be the up. Yes, yes. Within power limitations, which we discussed separately, let's not, so this power is, is, is a real life limitation on the perfection that we're describing. Let's, let's now just talk about the principle. Every circuit I will describe, I will not talk about little problems. So, in this spirit, this is the whole proof. We're finished. It's a follow, right? Okay. Second, we also already discussed, sort of. Second is, let's take a voltage divider here and take part of the output, not the whole output, but part of it, to the input. We know that this will be a, an amplifier. Let's show this, this golden rule. Um, we can see the uh, golden... First we check, is there negative feedback? Yes, there is. Second, we're saying, therefore, the in equals V plus, that's just our circuit, it's not even any kind of rule, this is the way we connect it, right? Equals V minus golden rule number one, equals, you will agree, R2 divided by R1 plus R2, V out, right? And, therefore, V out over V in, is R1 divided by R2 plus 1, right? And if I choose R1 greater than 0, it's already an amplifier with gain greater than 1. So the only way it will be gain equal to 1, which is follower, is when R1 is equal to 0. And of course, this is the same follower with the load R2. <coughs> So I have a special case of a follower. But generally it's an amplifier. If I want 100, amplification of 100, this is also called voltage gain. It's the same thing. I can have R1 over R2 equal to 99, and I have my 100. Again, the general principle is the same, that outside elements fully determine what the circuit will do. But the control will be as perfect as it can be. Okay? Nothing depends on the A 
which we don't even know what it is. And we don't want to, right? As long as it's large. Okay, this, this is the kind of thing that Harold Block, Black discovered in 1927. That was his original idea. Total control from the outside. Throwing away the giant game to get good control. And it took them 10 years to understand what he was saying. Or I'm just making an amplifier that has good control by default. Well, it wouldn't have such a good control without this. It's hard to make a controlled amplifier. And another thing, which I said once, let me say it now. Uh, it's not only the number that you improve. You improve every characteristic that you can think of. Frequency response, distortion. If you go a little bit, like if you give it um, a sinusoidal wave, um, normal amplifier can make it ugly looking sinusoidal wave. Suppose it's not perfect, nothing is perfect, transistor characteristics are not perfect. It will give you output which is not perfectly sinusoidal. This thing will keep it as close to the original shape as possible. Not only the number, but also distortions are removed. That sort of thing. So, um, it has many advantages. Okay. Amplifier. Second amplifier, which is called uh, inverting. This was non-inverting amplifier, right? We call it non-inverting because this is positive. Now we will have another one which is not as good as far as I can see, but introduces a good concept. So let's have amplifier like this. Now V in. And by the way, all these circuits are now in electronics uh, fashion, drawn exclusively in electronics fashion. If I wanted to call it physics fashion, I would have to show second terminals, and I never do that anymore. So it's all electronics fashion. R1. R2 output grounded. Okay. So we look at this circuit and we say we don't have such a good intuition. We will just have to use golden rules to see what it does. Let's use golden rules. <coughs> Is there negative feedback? Yes, check mark. If there is negative feedback, V plus or V non-inverting equals V inverting, right? This negative feedback, and we have. But what V non-inverting is zero because it's connected to zero, right? Therefore, V Inverting is always zero. No matter what I do, it has to stay zero all the time. Zero potential. Okay. If that's the case, I show this as a special point, which has zero potential, but not being able to suck current into the ground. That's a beauty. Right? Okay. If this is zero potential, the car, now I consider the cards. In this case, I definitely also have to concentrate on the second golden rule, which says currents into the things are zero. If that's the case, the current here must continue there. There is nowhere else for it to go. Right? So, talking about currents, V in, well, maybe we can do this in a Kirchhoff fashion. I, I find that easier. I could also say this divided by this equals minus this divided by that, but this Kirchhoff is more, more standard. So minus I R1 minus I, the same I, that's the point, R2 equals V up. Remember I said we can connect two points in the loop with Kirchhoff 
part of Kirchhoff full loop equation. That's what we're doing here. Connecting this voltage and that voltage with everything that's in between and the current, right? Everybody know that this is true, right? Okay. Then we haven't used that interesting fact. Let's use it. That fact tells me that this current is definitely going to be V in divided by R1. Right? You agree with that? Because this is zero. So the voltage drop across this resistor is V in. Therefore, by Ohm's law, this is true. Substituting this here, I will have V in minus V in divided by R1 times R1, R1 cancels out. V in minus V in is zero also, so that is nothing. So for minus V in divided by R1 times R2 equals V up. So the end result is that I get only six. This is zero. Everybody sees that, right? And I'm always looking for transfer function, if I see it appearing. So V out divided by V in is minus R2 divided by R1. So I conclude, if I want an amplifier, I can just make R2 larger than R1, and I will have my amplifier. 100 times R2 is 100 times larger than R1. Minus means the signal will be inverted, but I know nobody cares about it. So what's the difference, right? An interesting thought which just occurred to me. This is also a perfect voltage divider, isn't it? It's not only an amplifier, it's, it's a perfect voltage divider. Well, not so perfect. But the voltage divider, if I make R2 less than R1, I will reduce the voltage, maybe, if I want to do that. Why did I stumble and said, no, it's not perfect? Because the input resistance of this thing is not infinite, it's just R1. Clearly, the signal sees R1, and then this potential is zero, so the input resistance must be R1. That's not so perfect, but it's it's not it. Okay, but it's it's something. And we just learned an interesting concept of so-called virtual graph. This is called virtual graph. Okay, let's keep going because we still have a lot to cover, right? Um, what is next? Next, I believe, is current source. Current source has the same circuit as a non-inverting amplifier, but used in a very different sense. It's not used as an amplifier, it's used to keep constant current. So the circuit will be like this. Here we will have constant voltage applied, VDC. Let me call it VDC, we know that means constant line. Here we will have, essentially that same voltage divider I used in the non-inverting amplifier, but I will say this is a variable load RL. Somewhere here I'm measuring a current. I'm interested in that current now, so I will measure it. Here I have a fixed resistor, let me call it R0. See, I, I don't want to obscure the idea with RVs, which were just adjustments. I don't want to. Because the perfect explanation is maybe just a fixed resistor R0. And it's all connected like this. You may or may not want to show that this is VR, but we, now we're interested in the car. What is the current source? It's a device which keeps constant current for variable load. Why is that going to be a current source? I use golden rules to see if it's true. Golden rules says, golden rule number one says, check if you have a negative feedback. Yes, I do. Check mark. Therefore, VDC 
will be equal to the voltage anywhere here at this point, for example. Right? What is the voltage? Let me write that immediately. What is the voltage here? Uh, well, uh, it is. Uh, well, let me write in my. Um, no, I didn't ask the right question. Let me just say, yeah, the negative feedback, this equals to z, period, for now. Stop for a second. If this is the voltage here, VDC, what is the current flowing through that resistor R0? The current here will be I by Ohm's law equals VDC divided by R0. Where is this coming from, this current? Could it be coming from here, in part? No, it can't. This is infinite. I could just as well forget that this exists as a current. So the whole current flows here, the same current. Case proven. The current does not depend on RL. We never had RL enter our consideration. So that's it. Current will be fixed by these two parameters. And that's all. So again, at this point, you feel like a little electric shock, right? It's shocking in terms of being too simple. It cannot be that simple and missing something. No, this is the whole story. However, the story has a continuation in terms of limitation. Can I pass 100 amps through a mega ohm? from zero to one mega ohm. No, I can't. Why? Because V out can only swing to plus or minus 14 volts, and that puts a limitation. That's a different story. This limitation can be considered. It will be 14 volts minus VDC across RL as to provide that current. If you don't have enough juice there, then you will not have your car. So there is a limitation, practical limitation. But, but this is a different story. If, if people ask you to simply show that this is a current source, it's already done. This is the result. It does not depend on RF. Okay? Okay. Also, there may be a practical consideration here. How can I minimize the impact of this limitation. How can I have it working to the maximum value of RL? Clearly, if VDC is small, that will be better. I'll have more voltage to push that curve. But if it's small, maybe R R0 has to be small. So maybe if I make both VDC small and R0 small, I can still have that current and, and build it. So these are practical concerns. What was the purpose of the 14 minus VDC over that's a, that's a voltage across here, and therefore that's what pushes the current. Ohm's loss to works, right? So this is a limitation. Okay, let's move on. This was current source. Next, I believe we have integrator, right? Now, this is something I want you to learn today rather than just repeating old stuff because I just found something very nice. I should have found that maybe years ago. But you don't even have to think about how to design that integrator. You just use golden rules and it works. You can explain how it works immediately. So let's let's try to do that. That shortens the explanation tremendously because before I was going back to RC and saying this was imperfect, how can I improve that? It's all very good. It's a good thing to learn also. But now let's do it a little quicker. So we have V in. Uh, right. We have our OPAM. 
this is our virtual ground being provided here, and I forgot, of course, as I always do, this resistor R. Okay, and negative feedback is in the capacitor, and again, I will not at this level worry about complications. I just want to prove the principle. If there is a drift, later I will find some way to repair it. I don't care right now. Okay, so this is allegedly an integrate. How can I show that? I can use golden rules. And to use golden rules, I say, is there negative feedback? And yes, it is questionable, and later I will find some problems with it, but yes. There is a negative feedback, assuming it is good. Then, what do I know? I know that this point is going to be virtual zero. That's what negative feedback gives me, that this equals to that, virtual zero. Then I will say, the other, the other golden rule says that current cannot flow into the wall. Therefore, it will continue along here, just like in the inverting amplifier, except now I have a capacitor. So, let's, let's write the same Kirchhoff thing. V in minus I times R minus I C. Uh, wait, minus sorry. Uh, minus. Let me write little current because after all, this is this is all going to be time dependent. So I have to be a little more. Here. Minus B C. Huh? Well, B C. Yeah. Minus B C. Million also. Yes. Yes. All little things time dependent. Or Sometimes I can just remind myself it's time dependent on right normal letter, but it doesn't matter. Okay, minus VC equals V out, right? So we just used the golden rule, both golden rules to get together. One gave us, in fact, we haven't used the first one yet. We only used the car. We, we use the fact that the current cannot flow in here. We wrote down that first thing. Now, V in minus. This is the same as the current through the capacitor. So you will agree that this is minus C, V, V, C, V, T, isn't it? Right? I C equals C D V C D T and equal current through the resistor, right? That's good. Huh? And minus and R. Yes. Oh. Sorry. C R Right, right, right. Sorry. R C I absolutely right. D V C D T minus Oh boy. That's not what I wanted to see. What did I do wrong? Uh, if I let's see. <coughs> what Oh, no, no. Okay. I see what I, I, I don't want any derivatives. I'm saying this is an integrator. So let me keep this. I R here, and from from this I know that V C is one over C integral of I C V C, right? So I will instead substitute that V C. Okay, I think that will be better. Minus one over C 
integral of i c d2 equals v r. Now, uh, I C equals I R, and so if I multiply everything by yes, yeah, yeah. Um, doesn't you know, equal I R because you work with that? Or no. or I, I see oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah that helps me out equal C W. Right, because of the virtual ground, minus V out equals VC. Yes, you absolutely right, that's the key here. Minus VC is V out, right? Yeah? I think that, that's correct. Uh, yeah, it's V I times R and I R. Huh? It's V equals to I R. Let's... <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Right. So, yeah, okay. One more time, say so the same carefully. V minus I R minus uh minus V C equals V out, but this, this is equal, so the in equals because the V in and R, so you consider this one. V in is equal to IR. And V in R, yeah. So you just have V out and both negative V in. Right. Oh boy, this virtual ground, yes. Yes, V in equals I R, that's correct. So this is zero. In fact, I could start from that zero and not yes. even consider it. And so V uh, out is minus V C or uh, what the inversion, right? Yeah. Minus y no, 1 over C I C V C. Yeah. And multiplying by R, I have minus 1 over RC, the integral of uh, V R, V T, and this, V R is V in. So we got what we want. We got minus 1 over RC, integral of V in, V T. I'm sorry, I guess confused. Anyway, <laughs> With virtual ground and golden rules, we can prove all of that and we get the result without considering any kind of design ideas. Okay. Um, yeah. um, do we have a frequency dependent limitation in this case, like it wouldn't be just regular capacitor resistance? No, no, that's a beauty. We don't have any frequency considerations. It should work at any frequency. When we consider the imperfections of that capacitor, we find that we are limited by maybe one hertz, depending on numbers. And that that I don't want to consider right now. This is additional uh, thing, which is complication, which can be resolved, and we have a little limitation of frequency, but not as severe as before. Here. Okay, uh, so. Uh, Good. Finally, the last one, which was optional, but let me talk about this for a minute. Well, I wanted to, to be able to put this as a theoretical question using golden rules. Show me that this is a differential amplifier. 
Let's see if it's complicated or not. If you find it easy, maybe we can keep it. If not, I can exclude it. Um, but you, but the way we do it now is general approach. Golden rules apply to the circuit, see what it does. We don't have to measure it. We just have to understand what it says. So the circuit page which was there is this. Four resistors, but they're equal in pairs. R1 and R1, R2 and R2. So assuming they are perfectly equal, which in practice you have to choose something very close or maybe tweak them a little. But assuming they are equal, that's the circuit. And the claim is the claim uh, which we want to prove is that here the out. will be equal to R2 divided by R1, V1 minus V2. So there's a differential amplifier, but controllable. Not just like open loop one where very large factor is a little bit unknown, but here the factor will be exactly set up by ourselves. Now, Again, we can prove that simply using golden rules. But this involves a little bit of unpleasant algebra to prove. So that's the only complication. So in any case, let's start. At least we can start. We can say this negative feedback which we see here, we have the non-inverting equals the inverting. The, therefore, the non-inverting equals to this voltage here, which is fully set up by the voltage divider. It's really V2 divided by R1 plus R2 times R2. Right? And so this is. Should that be R1? R1 plus R2 and R2. No. Well, R2. I'm saying it shouldn't be V1 over R1 plus R2 because we're addressing V inverting. No, let I'm me... saying let me calculate voltage here. It's V2, okay. definitely V2, divided by R1 plus R2 is the current. Times R2 is the voltage. That's, that's the, being, well, I that's said, right, but V plus equals V1. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. Okay. Uh, then, using the, the same old things that we used before with the current, we can say V1 minus current I R1 minus the same current R2 equal V out. Combining these two things, you will get this result. But it took me a few lines of algebra to prove. I don't want to do it now, too tiring, uh, the algebra. You simply write the same thing as the current, knowing what, what this uh, point is it's not zero anymore. There is no virtual zero here. It's a different principle, right? It's a virtual equal voltage, but not zero. Um, 
If you write the current, you will prove that. Now, I don't know. Maybe I should have taught you the seven six. You said it wasn't going to be on the exam. And the right, and I said that. And okay. you haven't lectured about it before, right now. Right. So fine. <laughs> I'm just going to give it to the uh, donors or something. Because we all know it. No, we don't. That's what we have. We have the bonus that we don't. Maybe I'll do something like that. This would be additional bonus over one hundred score. Okay. Because the rest is pretty easy. What you do is you use the current and you combine everything and you do a little algebra and everything cancels out and this comes out. Okay, but I don't want to show it, so that probably tells me I shouldn't ask you. Necessarily, do it. Is okay. Now, so that finishes. We we finished all the circuits with this. Okay. When you said use the current, that would be v one minus i r one minus i r two equals v out, right? Right. Okay. Right. Cool. <clears throat> where does the where does this factor in? Well. Uh, just you, you can say uh, v, what you can say specifically this v1 minus v minus divided by r1 that's the current through here right this is one part it equals v v minus v1 minus v v inverting v inverting minus v out divided by R2. This is the equality of the current flowing through the small center. So then this gets substituted here, and you have a relationship between V out and V1 and V2, and that will come out. But algebra, you know, takes half a page. Anyway, we decided not to worry too much. Um, so, now we completely didn't talk about transistors, but we want to... Yeah. We know over seven equivalents. <laughs> <laughs> no, now I have to say that. Something doesn't be nice. Yes, How about like those ghost things? Yes. I like the rules. Were the rules? Okay. 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 So, transistor rules, right? What did, what did you want to do, transistor rules? Yes, yes. Okay, there are three main transistor rules, or for us, just three transistor rules, uh, which are the following. Um, if, if this is a transistor, Um, we distinguish two currents, small current in the base flowing into the emitter, uh, we call it IB, small current, and large current flowing through the transistor when it works and open between C and E, and we call it IC. Voltages we call since there are always differences of potential, we call these two letters. For example, V and VE is the voltage across here. Or VCE, voltage across there. But current requires only one letter because it's the same. Okay, so uh, these two currents are connected. The first rule says, by relationship, large current is proportional to small current where beta is a large number of 100. Can someone do that for this Usually it's above 75. That was a particularly unlikely thing. 
execution is large. You're very often close to 200. <laughs> um, so just a sufficiently large number, we don't know what it is. But, and we don't ever design things based on assuming we know what beta is, just rough estimates. So the first rule has a different formulation. Therefore, we say it's the same as to say IC is approximately equals to IB. Because it's the, the two currents, IB flows here, and here there is IE plus IB, and this is IC, and this is a junction, and Kirchhoff still works. So since IB is negligible compared to IE, maybe 1% or so, IC equals IE is the same state, but those two currents are very different. It's the same rule. So it's just making the assumption that IE is so small that yes. it's negligible. Yes, that's right, okay. because beta is large. Right. Okay. So that's rule number one. <coughs> rule number two says this junction between B and E is really a diet, and therefore VB is approximately VE plus 0.7 volts. 0.6 or 0.7. But so that's rule number two. Or some, sometimes we can say V. VE is always 0.7 volts. Again, that's the same state. And also the, the philosophy or idea behind these rules is that, yes, it could be different, but when it's different, transistor does not work. So these are rules applied to working transistors. Yes. Um, didn't you just say before that we need two letters to specify voltage? Well, brown. Yeah. This, this is a potential, ground? maybe, with respect to ground. Yes, this is with respect to ground, which we don't show. We often say, when I say VB, that means voltage or potential here with respect to ground. Okay. Or VE specifically between those two points. Ground is then is not important. Okay, and finally the third rule says transistor needs little daily rate, ra ration or whatever, of, of voltage of roughly 0.3 volts at least. It depends on the transistor, but nominally we consider 0.3 volts. In other words, VCE greater than about 0.3 volts. Now, we should understand it does not mean it's always 0.3 volts. It can be 14.7 volts or something like that, but at least greater than 0.3. Again, it, could it happen that the voltage here is less? Yes, it could, but then transistor is closed and nothing works. So when it works, it's like this, greater. So these are the three rules. We use them to explain transistor circuits. We want to, for example, explain why transistor follower increases the load resistance, why amplifier amplifies. These are, in a sense, what we've just done for unit 5 for up amps. It's the same stuff now applied to the transistor. Sort of general consideration without going into details, without considering any kind of limitation, but understanding what is the main function of the device. What will it do? And then we can later worry about detail. So, in this period, we can consider, for example, let's start with the follower. Oh, maybe I should have kept it, but we know the rules. Anyway. Uh, the follower with the transistor is something like this. It has a load, which is RE, it's a load. And it's connected to some power supply. And the output 
very important to remember that for the follower, the output is from from here, from from E. Output is VE. E. And I think that's all I need, again, in the spirit of understanding what it does, what is useful here, without going into any kind of design details which will be separate. So, I will claim that the only reason for this device is to increase effectively the way the load looks from this side. The resistance of the load will be increased by, I claim, by beta, large number. To do that, I have to first define what is the resistance from looking from this side. What do I mean by it? And the useful definition is that effective resistance, let's call it effective resistance, is going to be delta VB divided by uh, delta IB. Why am I using deltas? Because uh, from experience, I know that when things are non-linear, such as diodes and maybe transistors, I really don't want to talk about V divided by I. That may not be a meaningful quantity, but the change I can certainly consider. Um, Sorry, I just want to Where you have B. Is B connected to ground or is B connected to some other source? This, this, something goes in. Okay. There is another electrode which I don't show, which is connected to ground, and this is B to B. Okay. So, considering that, we say if, if I B, the first rule, number one, maybe when you do that, it may be useful to point which rule I'm using. Number one says IV is smaller than IC by a factor of beta. And I, I decided somehow I started using curved letters. Usually we don't, we're not so careful we use capital ones. But with curves, it's probably better, I think. So this one. Well, all time depends. So, um, I see divided by beta. That's the first rule I just rephrased. It. I see equals beta I see, right? Um, another rule, second transistor rule, says delta VB equals delta VE. By the way, when I wrote transistor rules, I wrote it like this. VE equals VB minus 0.7, right? If I take delta on both sides, I say change is the same because the difference is constant. So that's what I'm using. So from that, I, I so far, I will have R effective returning to here, right? R effective is delta VE divided by delta IC and times beta. I substitute. And the last step is delta IC definitely equals to delta IE. That's again the first rule. The big current is the same, and the changes in the big current are the same. So I will have delta VV divided by delta IE, and by Ohm's law, this is nothing but RE, the load, times beta. So I have beta times the load, or the RE. And I proved my point. So from this side, this resistance increases quite a bit by a factor of beta. 45 if it's a bad day, but otherwise maybe 100 or 200. 
Uh, still, we know how important it is to increase the um, load to construct something that will deliver the right voltage to the load, and that's what this does. Okay, then we go through the design sometimes, saying this has to be raised, this has to be in the middle, 7.5, therefore this has to be raised. You know, all this consideration. Let me not do this now, it's too much, right? Okay, um, amplifier. Very different animal and different considerations, but the same rules of law. So first we kind of probably draw a circuit and then argue that this will be an amplifier. The circuit will be, now I have to have a resistor here, which I will call RC. I will have a resistor there, which I will call RE, and I will take output here. And this is the signal I put on, on into the base controlling the amplifier. Transistor always is controlled from the base, right? The base does something, transistor does it stronger because the big current kicks in. That's basically my idea. Okay, so I want to see what voltage gain will do. In other words, I'm now interested in delta V out, which is delta VC. V out is VC divided by delta V in, which is VB. So it's essentially delta VC divided by delta VB that I'm interested in. Okay, well, to get delta V out or delta VC, maybe I can consider, again, part of Kirchhoff equation, which says, well, not part, but all relationship between voltages and currents in this part of a circuit, I might say. 15 minus IC, RC, equals V out. As simple as that, right? If I want deltas, that means it's like differentiating in this method. Delta of left side equals delta of right side, but 15 disappears. It's constant. So I have minus delta IC, RC, equals delta V up. Um, now, delta V in or delta V B by the second transistor rule equals Delta V E, which by Ohm's law, so this is num rule number two, and this is Ohm's law. Very different, right? By Ohm's law, delta V E here, this is V E, right? Delta V E will be equal to delta I E times R E. Okay. Delta IE equals delta IC, again going back to the first transistor rule. So we're oscillating back and forth, going to the same rule more than once sometimes. So I delta IC RE. Substituting these two things together, delta IC will cancel out, and for the ratio, right, putting it all into the ratio, as you can see, I will have that ratio actually equals to minus 
R C divided by R. You can tell by C answers. Okay? So I got myself probably an amplifier if I make R C greater than R E, it's an amplifier. By the way, also can it can reduce voltage if I want it to. I don't know if it's useful for anything. Nobody ever talks about it. But if R C is smaller, it will be reduced like a voltage divided through the transistor. So, yeah, what we've done so far is, without any regard to detail, to explain what, what will be the main function of this circuit. It can become an amplifier. There's this two resistors controlling of amplification. However, if you look closer, yes, you find a number of problems here, depending on what, what's here. Here, in our case, a single generator, which is 50 ohms to the ground. And if you put AC here, only the tops of this AC will be visible because everything else will be cut out. So you have to produce DC biasing which will allow the circuit to operate correctly. And we start by saying, this is the, another procedure. It's, it's really separate from the main idea. Now we're starting to design a working circuit. We're saying, well, it's best to have this point at 7.5, because then you can oscillate all you want up to 7.5 volts around. If this is 7.5 and additionally, Somebody tells us what the current is. That defines RC. At that point, we lose all degrees of freedom. We, we just proceed. We're saying, if we know RC, we know RE. But somebody also told us we want 20 amplification or something like that. If we know RE and we know the current, we know voltage here. Then we know voltage there. Then we build a voltage divider. Then we have to separate it with the capacitor so that we don't pull it down by the signal generator. Notice something, by the way, it's specific to us using a signal generator. Maybe some, some other circuit uses something else here. And the consideration is different. Maybe you don't need a separating capacitor. If, if you don't have a signal generator oscillating around zero, maybe the signal already comes at some level. That depends on the circuit. In our case, yes, we needed decoupling capacity. But going through this, I think we've all done it. Uh, I would rather not at this time, but we could go through all the numbers. So yeah. the reason why we put in the decoupling capacity because otherwise all the current would sort of go straight to the ground and the existing circuit and the Well, it's not that clear. It's not that I wouldn't put it this way. It, it's not a matter of current, it's a matter of voltage level. If I don't have a decoupling capacitor, I spend some time building a good voltage divider, which will raise this to 8 volts or something. Or maybe in case of an amplifier, 1.4 volts. Or something. But that was very necessary for this whole operation. If I directly connect this voltage divider to the signal generator, I suddenly find 50 ohms in parallel with some respectable kilo-ohm resistor here. And that's no good. That kilo-ohm st stops working. It's all shorted to the ground. So instead of 1.4 volts here, I will have 0.2 volts here. No good. Nothing will work until I separate the two sides with the capacitor, which charges to some DC level and then works, okay? Um, but that is a different, like it's a different thing, which is also part of our toolbox, but it's not the basic consideration. Then we had a concurrent source and this the current source. There we worried about the current being constant despite the changes in some resistor in the collector break. We can argue about that or we can go forward. <laughs> yes? um, with regards to 
like for the midterm, you had us do, a, you gave us a scenario that either drew up a surrogate, like I feel like something, or prove a theory or something like that. With the case for like lab unit four and five, where you have the transistors and the um, op amps, is it going to be something similar to that? You're going to give us a scenario and say, draw the circuit and calculate something, or just prove the theory? It could be this. Both versions are still there on the table. Yes, okay. we could say, here is the circuit, explain to me why it works and what it does. You don't have to design it, it's given to you. Or I can say, design the whole circuit. Don't show me how it works. I know that it's going to be a follower, but design the whole follower, maybe. And there are two versions, probably not both together. It would be maybe a little too much, but both on the table. How many questions? Uh, I don't, and I haven't finished yet, so maybe four or five, something else. Should be enough time if you, normally I, I aim at about an hour and a half, but if you sit there for three hours, that's fine, we can stay here. Um, and there is nothing wrong with it. So you will have up to three hours, maybe even a little longer if necessary. But I, I don't consider time to be of, of essence. Is it like heavier emphasis on the second half, or is it equal? I would still think that it's emphasis on new material compared to the first half. <coughs> yeah. Okay. It's a question of who exhausts whom quicker. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're succeeding at almost done. Uh, uh, but um, we can talk about what time is it? Uh, okay. Well, okay. If you have more questions, please ask. Uh, you can just do it for me. You just said the current source is dependent on a change in the resistance of the blocker branch. Is that what you said? Well, in the transistor version, yes, right. yes. yes. We, we have the load, the changing load is placed strategically in the collector version. And there we show that it will keep constant current until, again, we exceed some limits. That worked pretty well. It was, I got one set of data I saw which was very good. I'm comparing transistor characteristic was what the current source is doing. It was five times better in terms of security. I remember somebody mentioned it. <clears throat> so it's just much better than transistor characteristic itself because of the negative feedback. How is there negative feedback in the transistor current source? Well, okay, since we already have some interest in the current source, let's discuss it completely. Maybe. Let's go through So we have a transistor, we have a variable load which we place in the collector branch. Place here set the resistor RE in the emitter branch, and we take base not uh, in terms we, we want to think now not in terms of current but in terms of some kind of fixed voltage which will fix the current. So we take here a voltage divider or potentiometer really uh, and deliver voltage from a potentiometer. And we don't worry too much about this being connected directly to the base because we argue that because of this resistor the diode is protected. The current is limited by the resistor and the diode. In terms of voltage when it works again this will be 0 0.7 volts. And this will be whatever remains up out of 
there are certain voltage here. Let's say seven volts, just to take a number. Six point three will be applied here, and point seven uh, there. And if I change this, it's always 0.7 here, whatever remains of the cross this resistor, as long as it can take so much without heating, it's, it's all protected. So um, I think that was the basic circuit. There is no output. Notice our goal is no longer to deliver voltage anywhere. So we don't worry what we call an output. There is no output except we want to measure that current, so maybe we put an ammeter somehow here to measure that current. Um, our goal is to deliver constant current to a changing load. Now, so we will argue that this is what it will do. Again, using I guess a list of what else can we? <clears throat> um, well, we start this argument by saying we know transistor characteristic IC versus PE CE across the transistor looks something like this. And we know that this is a good region where everything works, and this is a bad region called saturation, where transistor doesn't work. So we're interested in this region. Um, so we're saying even if we just use somehow transistor characteristic, it more or less delivers a constant current, but not perfect because there is some slope. Um, <coughs> we can also think about this whole thing in terms of um, load lines, <coughs> particularly useful application of load line uh, thinking here, because we're saying, considering uh, this whole branch from 15 volts to zero, on the right side of the transistor. Um, um, the load line will, will look something like this. 15 volts here and there it will intersect at 15 volts divided by RL, this variable resistor, plus RE. So the higher is RL, the, the lower goes the load line. Eventually, when RL is too large, we can see that there is no way I can maintain even approximately constant current. A very large RL, it will have to fall into this bad region and decrease. So that would be very poor, but still a current source, even like that. But we have an additional argument. And that's why we introduced that resistor here. The additional argument is that this will help us to jump. There is no way to change this IV curve. It's given to us. It's part of a transistor itself. But there is infinite number of them. There is a family of curves. And we can design a clever circuit like this one, where we will go from one curve to the higher one, to the other, to keep the current approximately constant as this load line comes down. And we argue it like this. We're saying, well, let's, let's start increasing the load. We're increasing the load. That pushes the load line down. So the, the point wants to move from here to here if it is on the same curve. But let's consider this in more detail. If, if that happens, the current will tend to decrease because the curve has sloped. The current decreases a little bit. 
Decreasing current will also flow through the RE, decreasing voltage at that point by Ohm's law. So when big current, this is the big current decrease. When the big current decreases, the voltage here decreases. But the left side of the dial is fixed. That is voltage divider. Right? It has fixed voltage. And the floor is decreasing. So the second floor level here is fixed, but the ground floor is, is starting to fall down. That increases the voltage across the dial. So the voltage across the dial goes up, therefore increasing current IB. V, 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 current IV is increased. Well, that will increase the big current by the first rule because IC equals beta IV when the distor works, right? So, we started with the idea that current is decreasing and we, sh we have shown that the circuit will push the current up. We can reconsider the whole thing and say, well, well, what if current decreases, and it increases instead of decreasing? Or what, maybe we turn it back and the current starts to increase. Well, we will go through the same argument and argue that that will, again, try to stabilize the current at a constant volume. The negative feedback we know now from Unit 5 always tries to keep circuit parameters as constant as possible. So the current, if it decreases, will tend to increase, jump to another curve. If it decreases, it will jump, and so on. If it increases, it will jump to the lower curve, and so on. So the current will be more stable than this curve. And that's what people found, I believe you measured that. It was considerably more stable, it was very decent. So, that's, I don't know how to explain it with less detail than this. It kind of requires that sort of explanation. So it's not just writing a little formula saying, here is my proof that the current is constant. I don't know how to do that. All I can do is this argument. But that's what it is. Can you write like a paragraph for this if you left on the test? Yeah, if, if you see it on the test, hopefully I will not require to write two pages. Maybe a short explanation. Or maybe you wouldn't see it. No. Yeah. Um, it was easier to argue uh, about current source with the op-amp, which we already did today. That's kind of just old rule. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Why is the I guess I can have five times this. Yeah. 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 Y